Fellini's Eight and a Half is to me the film that captures what it actually is like to be a film director, to make a movie. The strange thing about it is that I knew that was the truth long before I directed a film. And having now directed one or two films, I know it's even more truthful. There are moments in the film that still stick in my head. One of them is Mastrioni working his way down a corridor of the hotel where the production office is and people coming out of doors trying to get his attention. And he's developed a little dance. And this is the way he deals with the fact that the whole world is coming in on him, questions, answers, answers, they need answers, and he doesn't have any. And he tap dances his way through it. And it's something I've subsequently learned is the only way to get through film directing is to do just that. And I thought clearly what has happened here is that Fellini was working on a movie. He didn't know really how to finish it. He didn't, he, it wasn't coming together. And so he wrote a movie about making a movie about a director who doesn't know how to make or finish his movie. And then he mixes all of that with his complex life. <laughs> with his parents, with his girlfriends, with his wife. And you keep all this swirling around the fact that he's trying to make a movie and can't get to grips with it. And at the same time, you're trying to take all of these things and make them into the movie. And I think the last shot sums it up, where he's got all those characters of his life in a circle to Nina Rota's music, to the, the little boy who's leading the band, and they're going around and around. And that was Fellini, and that's what every film director is, that little boy. I mean, one of the things I try to use movies for is a way of not ever growing up, to always maintain a child's point of view of the world. I don't care what movie I make. It's, it's, it's trying to see the world with a sense of awe and amazement and surprise and, and to sort of show the rest of the world how extraordinary the world is, because most films don't do that, and I think Fellini always did that. Dreams were clearly important to him. Dreams were a way of leaping out of the day-to-day -day problems and trying to get back to before the problems existed and hopefully resolving them in real life. The opening sequence is still one of the great opening sequences of any film ever made. To be trapped in a traffic jam with the world just compressed around you and that need to escape from it and to climb out of a car that's filling up with some kind of bilious smoke while the world is watching and then float off and then suddenly being a kite or a balloon with a string around his leg being pulled down. <laughs> and then you realize it's about a person with even a bigger problem. And so now we've got our past, we've got our present, everything working together and, and, and struggling against each other. I mean, he captured everything in that opening sequence. I think that sequence is probably the most important in my life because I've been trying to do versions of that ever since. When I saw the movie the first time, I was astonished by the use of time and storytelling. Everything is fluid, and yet it seemed totally true and right. I think it's the way I seem to see the world. It's all, everything is happening at the same time, and whether it's your childhood, whether it's the problem on the film, it's all happening together. I have this suspicion that Fellini was being totally pragmatic when he made it, because he didn't know quite how to make this thing into a conventional film. So, well, forget about conventional film. Let's just fragment it. Let's do it truthfully and see what you end up with. I hope I'm right. I mean, I never asked him. I mean, we were making Munchausen. I was at Chinichita, and I was on his turf, and he kept floating in and out of uh, our activities. And it's the one question I never asked him. <laughs> Maybe I, I'm happier not knowing the truth and just imagining my truth. Fellini, I always thought, was a, you know, a fantasist, a, a dreamer, until I went to Rome. And now, I don't know if the Rome I got to, to look at was a Rome that had been influenced by Fellini and had become to look and behave as if it was a Fellini movie, or whether he was, in fact, a documentary filmmaker. I suspect he was a documentary filmmaker. It was always there to be seen. And I think I'm in the same school that he was in. I look at the world, and people say, oh, well, what you're showing on film is very grotesque and odd and bizarre. I said, no, 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 it's just stuff I see. And Fellini was a cartoonist. I was a cartoonist. We both came from the same background, which means you look at the world and you stretch it, you pull it, and you, you distort it. And that's what Fellini did. Saragina, with all the schoolboys after, that great, fat, huge lump of femininity, I suppose, has stuck with me ever since I saw it, because in my Python cartoons, I always had these great bulbous women, these great balloon-like women, and they all came from Saragina.
I think at the time, if I do remember, there was a sense of, you know, that he was very anti-women. Women were objects. But he admits that right in the film. He treats them like objects, but they're treating him in their own way. He doesn't lie about his weaknesses. He puts them right out there, and so he's got Mastrioni with his whip cracking, and it's, yeah, it's obvious. I mean, it's not like he's hiding any of his problems. He just puts them out there. There's an upfrontness about Italians that I find extraordinary, and especially as a, you know, an Anglo-Saxon Protestant, it frees me when I see that, that ancient culture. I mean, it's earth goddess, it's mother goddess. The, the female element is the most important thing in, I think, in Italian culture. And Fellini has women at the center of everything he does. He's obsessed with them. They terrify him. He loves them. He hates them. You know, they're, they're mothers, they're virgins, they're daughters, they're, they're whores, they're everything. It's this worship of the female in it, all of its glory. And the Italians do that better than anybody else, and I think they're the most honest. The rest of us in our more uh, conscribed, safe worlds uh, pretend we're not like that. Eight and a Half is, the, is Fellini's movie that sticks most with me. It may not even be my most favorite movie. There may be others that I like more, but it's the one that sort of struck such a deep chord that was so truthful and, and lingering that it, it's the one I will always refer back to. Even when Fellini falls on his face, and he's done it a few times with his films, there are always moments in them that will stand up against anything else out there. And they're the things that I think I remember. They're the little bits of shrapnel that go in in a moment of just sheer clarity and brilliance and magic. And he's left more of those bits of shrapnel in my brain than most people have.